Hi, welcome back to the Fix or Repair DIY channel. One of the reasons that I started this channel is to help solve problems that everyday owners like yourselves run into. And surely, one of the biggest issues that we're seeing today is the price of gas. And this is made worse for F-150 owners because you're essentially driving a moving wall down the road, which weighs 5,800 pounds. It takes a lot of energy to get this vehicle moving and to keep it moving. So in this video, we're going to cover techniques that you can start using today to start saving fuel. This is called hypermiling. And we have a few more tricks up our sleeve because we're driving an F-150 Power Boost hybrid drivetrain. Now, even if you're not driving an F-150 Power Boost, stick with me till the end because there's still a lot of these techniques for hypermiling that you can use in your own truck regardless of the powertrain that you have. And I know that the very second that I publish this video, I'm gonna realize that I forgot some other technique or there's gonna be some new method that I was not able to put into the video. So this is where you come in. Let me know what your techniques are for hypermiling in the comments below. Let me know if I've missed something. And away we go. So first of all, what is hypermiling to begin with? Hypermiling is driving a vehicle using techniques that maximize fuel efficiency without being a menace to everybody else at the same time, which is something that I just put in there and we'll talk about this later. Before we get into the actual techniques, let's talk about the Power Boost drivetrain for a second. First off, at the front of the engine compartment, we have the internal combustion engine, which in this case is the 3.5 liter EcoBoost internal combustion engine. From there, that leads in series to a 35 kilowatt or 47 horsepower electric motor. It's on the same shaft. And that leads right into the 10 speed transmission. So you can see that these engines, the 3.5 EcoBoost, the 35 kilowatt electric motor, lead into and work in conjunction with each other, feeding power into the transmission. And of course, there is a 1.5 kilowatt hour lithium ion rechargeable battery, which is the primary current source for the electric motor and the ProPower onboard inverter. The transmission can be driven by the electric motor alone or in combination with a 3.5 liter EcoBoost internal combustion engine. If we understand what influences the drive selection we can work with the drivetrain to produce better mile per gallon results. And now we're gonna talk about the physics of hypermiling. If we don't understand the physics behind what we're doing, we're gonna get very inconsistent results because we're not gonna understand why we're getting the results that we are. Hypermiling is all about the conservation of momentum through the use of energy. Think about how a cyclist goes up a hill. Now he's gonna to have to expend a lot of kinetic energy in order to gain altitude. So he's gonna to have to put a lot of power into his pedals to overcome gravity, friction, everything else like that so that he can gain altitude. Now, when he does gain altitude, he's gonna convert all of that or some of that kinetic energy into potential energy. So sitting on the top of the hill, he has a massive amount of potential energy that he can use. It's not moving. He can't exactly feel it. But because of the fact that he's raised his altitude, he now has much more potential energy. And he can simply convert that potential energy into kinetic energy once again, by just coasting down the hill. All that energy gets converted from potential into kinetic so this cycle repeats over and over again, energy in, energy out, back and forth, up and down the hills. And it depends on what's providing that energy, which is gonna be the source of our techniques in hypermiling. Now, when it comes to hypermiling, you're not gonna find these definitions in a textbook. And I'm sure there's a physicist out there which has defined these in a much more rigid manner, but I'm just gonna use the ones that I think I can communicate with you. So we're gonna have different forms of energy that we're gonna use through our power boost. One is free energy, and we'll define these in a second. There's inexpensive energy that we can use at our disposal, and there's also expensive energy that we can use if we wanna push our truck forward. 
We want to leverage the free and inexpensive forms of energy to increase our mileage while minimizing the use of expensive energy. I'm sure you can figure out which ones that these are, but let's go ahead and define them. Free energy to me would be using gravity to coast down a hill. Yes, we paid for it earlier by gaining elevation to increase our potential energy, but let's consider a gravity assist as free energy, which we should use whenever possible. There's also inexpensive energy would be using the EV battery or electric motor to supply drive. This is inexpensive energy, especially if we're able to recharge the battery by harvesting energy during regenerative braking and not charging directly by the internal combustion engine. And then of course we get to expensive energy, which is anything supplied by the internal combustion engine, which in this case is the 3.5 liter EcoBoost engine. The internal combustion engine is the primary motive force behind climbing longer hills, raising elevation, which will be used later through gravity, driving long stretches of straight road, and charging the battery as well. This type of energy has the highest marginal cost per mile. We know it's expensive and it's getting more so day by day. Only limited amounts of energy can be stored in the battery. So limiting that expensive energy is gonna be our goal for hypermiling. Again, back to conservation of momentum. If we have spent expensive energy to get our vehicle in motion, like light turns green and you step on the accelerator, you're burning gas to get up to speed. That's momentum that you built out. So we've spent that expensive energy to get our vehicle in motion via the 3.5 liter internal combustion engine. Then we wanna keep that vehicle in motion via the principle of conservation of momentum. We'll see how to do this a little later. It requires a lot of expensive energy to put the vehicle in motion and get it up to speed, especially up an incline. This is the most expensive form of this. So we'll try to keep our vehicle in motion using free or inexpensive energy once it's in motion. The more we can leverage these free and inexpensive forms of energy, the lower our cost per mile will be. The F-150 Power Boost engine allows you an amazing amount of control over these factors. It's really fun. It almost becomes a form of game to be able to use these factors to lower your per mile cost. And we're gonna seek this energy distribution via what I call static and dynamic hypermiling factors. Again, these are my terms, but I hope this way of explaining things makes sense in how we break it down. So to me, that's kind of the science and art of hypermiling. The hypermiling statics are things that we can't really change. These are things that, that you set up in your truck even before you leave the driveway. Those are the statics. And then of course we have the dynamics, which is more of the art of hypermiling. This is where your skill and your ability to manipulate the controls of your truck will pay off benefits for you in terms of lowering your cost per mile. And with that, we start with hypermiling statics. Hypermiling statics are factors that we can control statically or before we put the vehicle into motion. I tried to include as many as I could think of. However, I'm sure that I missed a few. Most of these are common sense. So I'll go through these quickly. If you think of some additional static factors or disagree with any of these, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you. The first one that we have is weight. More weight means more mass to overcome inertial momentum and more friction on the tires, wasting energy. The less excess weight you have in your truck, the better mileage you will attain. Get that junk out of your bed. The second one is tire inflation. Underinflated tires have more rolling resistance, but don't overinflate in an effort to reduce rolling resistance. You will also reduce your contact patch, which is not safe. Follow tire pressure guide on your door sticker. The third, Hypermiling static is engine tune. A poorly maintained internal combustion engine will not run as efficiently as one that's been well maintained. Fortunately, it's not hard to maintain the 3.5 liter 
EcoBoost engine in good tune, and most of these are relatively young since the Power Boost is only two years old. The next hypermiling static is lift. I see stats every day of how even a two inch lift will degrade the fuel efficiency of a truck. I realize why people wanna lift their trucks, especially for off-road use, but understand that the lift will impact your aerodynamics and efficiency. The next hypermiling static is tires. Adding larger off-road tires will also negatively impact your fuel mileage. These tires are substantially heavier. So the force required to move these tires from a standstill is much larger. In addition, the rolling resistance is going to be significantly higher versus a street tire. So if you're about to get a set of Nitro Ridge Grapplers, expect to see a hit on your mileage. The next static is air dams. Another popular mod is to remove or alter the stock air dam under the front bumper. This will also negatively impact the fuel mileage if you remove this. They are for a reason to clean up the lower aerodynamics of your truck. The next hypermiling static is outside temperatures. Cold outside temperatures can be very challenging to the power boost drivetrain. Read a lot of forum posts from people that were up in uh, northern latitudes that were having a very, very difficult time getting some decent mileage from their power boost when it was really, really cold outside. Batteries tend to lose charge in the cold if not driven frequently, so you have less available inexpensive energy. The internal combustion engine also runs very rich when cold. This will use more fuel. You will not be able to duplicate summer mile per gallon numbers in colder temperatures. You can only work on limiting the drop in efficiency. Garaging your vehicle goes a long way to helping this. The next hypermiling static is eco mode. Does your F-150 power boost run more economically in eco versus normal mode? Well, this appears to vary by driver and by truck. It appears to quicken the upshifts and it does soften throttle mapping. But I have no evidence of this beyond seat of the pants feel. I don't know exactly how they engineered this. Some report better mileage in normal mode. Some report better mileage in eco mode. Experiment to see which mode works best for you. The next type of miling static is summer blend fuel. Summer blend gasoline has about 1.7% more energy than equivalent winter blend. However, summer blend gas usually costs more at the pump. Expect to see slightly better MPG numbers using summer blend gas, assuming all other factors remain constant, such as outside temperature. The next type of miling static is fuel octane. The owner's manual calls for a minimum 87 octane. Some report better fuel mileage running higher octane fuels. Some report no difference whatsoever. So they run 87. Understand that any potential gains from running higher octane will likely be offset by the higher fuel costs. I'm going to avoid those religious arguments here and just advocate that you do your own experimentation and come to your own conclusions. The next type of miling static is non-ethanol gas. In some areas of the United States, you can obtain non-ethanol gasoline. Non-ethanol gas is a better shelf life than the normal fuels blended with ethanol, and non-ethanol gas reportedly has more energy and can lead to about 3% better fuel mileage. Well, this better fuel efficiency will be offset by additional cost, if you can get it. Most of these statics are just common sense. If you run with the lightest, most aerodynamic setup, you'll see the most efficient operation of your truck. You have to balance that against the utility and enjoyment that you receive from running your truck in a particular configuration. I'm not trying to be a killjoy here, just trying to help you save money running your truck. Okay, those are the simple static factors concerning hypermiling. If you don't optimize those, then you'll continue to have poor results. It's like having a poor foundation for your house. You don't want to build on top of it. You'll get cracks in every floor. Now, let's get to the art of hypermiling with the dynamic factors. 
And now finally, we're going to get into the cool stuff. This is the hypermyeling dynamics. This is the name that I've given for things that occur after you've put the vehicle into motion. These are things that we can control dynamically. This requires skill on your part, and it helps to understand the physics that drive these factors. Before we get started on dynamics, I have to start with a caution. Please don't impact the flow of traffic as you pursue hypermiling. If you're hypermiling your truck by holding up other traffic, you're not being a good energy steward, you're just being a jerk. If you're seeing this type of nonverbal communication, you're doing it wrong. The first hypermiling dynamic is boost. We are driving a 3.5 liter twin turbo internal combustion engine which is called the eco boost, but it's either in eco mode or boost mode. There is no eco while you're in boost mode. Change your gauge cluster to show the boost gauge. If you're reading on the boost gauge, if you're getting into 10 or 15 PSI of boost, that means that you've got your foot heavily into the floor in the accelerator pedal, and there's no way you're gonna get decent mileage from that. Does that mean you can't use the turbos? Well, no, use them if you have to. If you're trying to hit a highway on ramp and you need to get up to speed, then go ahead and uh, close those wastegates and get moving. But for the most part, if you're trying to optimize mileage, you want to keep the boost to zero. The next hypermiling dynamic is speed. The speed at which you drive your truck has a huge impact on the amount of power necessary from the engine to keep it at that speed. I've seen so many posts saying, hey, yeah, I normally drive at 80 miles an hour. Why does my fuel efficiency so bad? This is not a linear relationship between speed and drag on your truck. Drag of the vehicle is related to speed squared. The required power to overcome that drag is drag times speed. So required power to overcome drag is speed cubed. Makes sense that the faster you go in an exponential manner, you'll create much more drag and your mileage will suffer. The faster you drive in that top gear, the more power and fuel is necessary. What I would suggest is a speed of about 45 to 55, while in 10th gear will generally provide the most efficient operation of your truck in terms of raw MPG. So if you're on back roads, if you're going after a high mileage, Somewhere between 45 to 55 and trying to keep it in 10th gear without lugging the engine will produce some really actually dramatic results. You should be able to get somewhere near 28 to 30 miles per gallon on some stretches of road. However, if you're on the main interstates, you're not going to be going 45 to 55. You have to keep up with the flow of traffic. If you want to go slower than the flow of traffic, please keep to the right lane. The next dynamic is cruise control. Lots of hypermiling experts tell you to use adaptive cruise control to improve fuel mileage. I disagree with using it all the time. The problem is adaptive cruise control is reactive in that it cannot anticipate uphill segments and will accelerate hard trying to play catch up once your truck slows down below your limit that you set. You can optimize economy if you Reload a hill by accelerating on the downhill leg. So this is what trucks do all the time. If you see a downhill leg going to an uphill leg, what you'll see is trucks will accelerate into this end of it so that they can capture as much, you know, create as much kinetic energy as possible, which will help push them near the top of the hill. And then by doing this, they minimize the the amount of expensive energy that they have to put into the engine to get over the top. Because as we talked about, this is more inexpensive energy because we're using gravity assist. Adaptive cruise is fine for long flat stretches of the road, but if you've got a hilly area, I would recommend going off the adaptive cruise because you're smarter than the cruise control and you can do a better job of anticipating hill load. The next hypermiling dynamic is traffic lights. These are a fuel economy killer. If you have to come to a stop, even if your truck is not idling, it still means that you have to take that 5,800 pound truck 
and accelerate it back up to speed again. You're getting no conservation of momentum. And guess what? Primarily the engine that's gonna get you back up to speed again is the 3.5 liter internal combustion engine, which we said uses expensive energy. So on flat or downgrades, you can sometimes get lucky enough to use the EV section of the powertrain alone. I see this all the time if I'm starting out from a light, if I'm gentle with the accelerator, on a downhill stretch, I can get up to speed using just the battery and the electric motor alone. But the best strategy is to practice conservation of momentum. Don't rush up to traffic lights and drop anchor. Try to hit green light safely. Hang back and wait for that light to change and then see if you can coast back up to speed by integrating with the flow of traffic. Do your best to time these red lights so you can save your hard earned momentum. Now let's specifically talk about hills again because it is so important how you drive on a hill. It will have a huge impact on your overall economy for that drive. So driving uphill by far is the worst dynamic for fuel economy. While driving downhill allows potentially free operation. When you're driving uphill, do not use cruise control as we talked about before. And here's a new one. Do not accelerate, strive to maintain a constant speed. If there is no one behind you, then you can naturally allow the truck to slow somewhat. Again, this is on back roads. If I'm going on slower back roads, if I'm going uphill, it's okay. If there's nobody behind me, I'm not gonna force the truck up the hill at a preset speed. I'm gonna let it find its speed and I'm gonna sense when it's starting to struggle and lug the engine. Something you can also do is to lock out the ninth and 10th gear so you don't lug the engine. So it's okay to run the engine at a slightly higher RPM if it's more in the power band. Lift off the accelerator before you crest the hill so you don't have to accelerate all the way up to the top. You can lift off the accelerator and get some free momentum as the truck crests the hill and then starts to use gravity. You can do this before you crest the hill. Again, I have to mention that how you treat an uphill segment will have a huge impact on your overall economy for the drive, perhaps more so than just about anything else. Now let's talk about the electric vehicle or EV section of your drivetrain versus the internal combustion engine. Anytime you're driving with the internal combustion engine off, you're gaining efficiency by using inexpensive energy. Again, it's not free energy. Some energy had to be harvested through the internal combustion engine charging it up or momentum capture through regenerative braking. However, it's much less expensive than that produced by burning fuel. The PowerBoost 1.5 kilowatt hour battery is relatively small yet can power the truck for short distances over flat or downhill terrain. You should make every possible effort to allow the battery to power the truck. This will only be possible for flat or downhill segments of your drive or just driving around the parking lot even. I love to use this inexpensive energy to gain speed on a downhill segment before climbing hill on the other side. So again, if we're doing the hill thing, if I know that I'm gonna be climbing a hill on this. So what I will do is as I'm coasting down, I will sometimes even tap the brake while I'm going down to shut off the internal combustion engine. There's no need for it to be idling. So I'm on EV only. And then once I'm on EV, I will start to very slowly press the accelerator very gently and try to accelerate on this downhill segment, just like big semi trucks do, right? So gain that momentum on the downhill part of it while you're using the battery and the electric motor as much as possible. So peak out down here. You can even run EV all the way up to maybe about here. So once it starts to struggle, the ice will kick on and then you're gonna be on hybrid mode again. But you can generate so much momentum going up the next hill by using that battery on the way down the hill. So you're using gravity assist as well as the inexpensive energy of the electric motor. The next dynamic is the brake coach. If you employ the brake coach via your instrument cluster, every time you stop, it shows you how much of the stopping was produced by regenerative braking. 
or how much of it was through the service breaks. In this example here, 100% of the energy was returned. So 100% of the braking was achieved through regenerative braking. So if you see this 100% energy return, that means 100% of the stopping power was provided by the electric motor. Anything below that figure, so if it's 75%, indicates that the service brakes, which are the rotors and pads, had to employ which wasted available energy through friction. So seek to get this number as close to 100 as you can. Generally, it requires a very slow, controlled stop, not pushing hard on the brakes. This will give you 100% energy returned. All right, the next dynamic is the EV coach. If you don't understand the EV or hybrid system in the F-150 Power Boost, then the EV coach will help show you the impact that your right foot is having when you're either in electric or hybrid mode. So if you're a little less experienced with driving a hybrid, this will help you to understand the impact that your right foot is having. After that, I really don't recommend using this mode beyond the initial training because it's too easy to keep your eyes off the road and glued to this EV coach and then all of a sudden things are happening in front of you and there's enough of that on the road these days. If you learn to drive the power boost as if an egg was between your foot and the accelerator pedal, then this is what the EV coach will teach you. Now let's talk about a really controversial dynamic, which is drafting. Can you significantly cut your forward drag by drafting a summary trailer? The answer is yes. The same concept is used in cycling, running, horse racing, any motorsport, you name it. Should you do it? My official recommendation would be no. The Mythbusters Discovery Channel program famously did an experiment that showed that drafting a semi-trailer at 100 feet distance caused an 11% increase in fuel mileage versus the control. Okay, but at 65 miles an hour, that's 95.3 feet per second. That's not, you're, you're pretty close, right? That's only about a second of following distance. The National Safety Council advocates a three-second following distance or more to the vehicle in front of you. You might experiment to see what benefits, if any, that a three-second trailer draft might provide. This is where adaptive cruise control in a flat road would be useful. Getting great efficiency out of your power boost engine, or for that matter, any other powertrain that you drive, really comes down to your skill in understanding how to conserve and maintain energy, as well as select what type of energy that you want to use for the application at hand. Let's wrap up this video by going through a couple of examples and I'm going to walk you through what I'm seeing and what I'm doing during these examples. Enjoy. Okay, in this example, I'm driving on a four lane city road with urban traffic and I have just topped out on the hill. So you'll see in the inset on the lower left, the engine speed is zero, which means I'm in EV mode. I'm driving this based on the battery and the further I go down the hill, now I'm getting a little bit more gravity assist. Now I know that there's a traffic light coming up at the bottom of the hill, perhaps in about a quarter of a mile or so. So I'm not trying to accelerate using EV mode down the hill. I'm try not trying to capture momentum and drive momentum as I get down to the bottom of the hill because the uphill segment of it is at least a half mile away. So it's more about keeping the internal combustion engine off at this point. I can see a traffic light coming up. I can see stop traffic in front of me. I don't want to rush up to this stop traffic light. I want to start slowing down now using regenerative braking so that hopefully by the time I get there to that traffic light, the light has turned green and I can conserve momentum. And you can see that I've done exactly that because I'm able to now filter into the traffic. The cars in front of me have left the light and I can start to adapt my momentum into this. And notice also that the motor is still off. I'm still on EV mode right now. And now the internal combustion engine finally turns on because I've gotten to a flat to slight uphill area and it makes sense for the motor to go back on. But I've just spent the last 
at least half a mile on inexpensive energy alone. Here's another example, two-lane residential road, speed limit about 35 miles an hour. I'm currently going uphill. You'll see the engine on the left. You can see the tachometer shows the internal combustion engine is spinning. As I peak the hill and get on the downhill side, sometimes to shut the engine off, the internal combustion engine, you want to just tap the brakes, which gets you into EV mode. Now you can see the internal combustion engine is off, the tack is zero, and I'm on EV mode only, and it's my intention to stay on that mode as long as I can. I'm currently running on the battery in the electric motor. I'm about to turn left. And if I do this right, I can still stay in EV mode using just the battery and the electric motor. This is a 25 mile an hour, fairly flat residential street. So with some technique, I can still stay in EV mode. I don't even need to do 25 miles an hour. I'm not in a hurry. There's nobody behind me. My next action is a right-hand turn, but fortunately it's a yield and not a full stop. So using conservation of momentum, if I'm able to look behind me and make sure that the road is clear, Keeping that momentum will allow me to stay into EV mode as I turn right. All right, if you've made it this far into the video, I'd like to thank you very much for your persistence. Obviously, uh, saving money through fuel costs is very, very important these days. And I'd like to thank you for watching this video. Did I miss anything? If so, please let me know in the comments below. So thanks again for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.